Welcome to the MOOC on Pacific Studies, offered by the University of the South Pacific. My name is Frank Thomas, Senior Lecturer in Pacific Studies at the Oceania Center for Arts, Culture, and Pacific Studies. I am the presenter for this session, focusing on diaspora and identity. At the end of this session, you will be able to demonstrate an understanding of the social and cultural implications of globalization for the Pacific, reflect on the development challenges facing the Pacific in reference to health and environmental impacts, and reflect on the links between globalization and sustainable livelihoods in the Pacific. In the aftermath of World War II, reconstruction of shattered economies was closely linked to the political struggle between two opposing ideologies vying for political influence. Capitalism, led by the United States, and communism, advocated by the Soviet Union and its satellites. Massive influx of financial capital by Western powers guaranteed the loyalty of several developing nations. The Pacific Island region was seen as vital to the security of the United States, which had established a strong military presence in places such as Hawaii, Guam, and to a lesser extent across Micronesia. Despite the importance of foreign aid over several decades, there has been relatively little economic growth. However, Pacific Island economies are for the most part not poor by the usual standards of world poverty. Provision of basic needs has seldom been under threat for the indigenous populations. And living standards across much of the regions continue to be underwritten by official transfers and private remittances. At the same time, tourism and fisheries have increased earnings. Although subsistence production across the Pacific has declined in relative terms after World War II, and cash earning activities have increased, the internationalization of markets for goods, services, and factors of production over the past three or four decades was less of a change for Pacific Islanders than for the inhabitants of most of the world's developing countries. Because of the Pacific's pre-existing freedom of trade and capital flows and its long history of labor migration both within the region and to metropolitan economies. Industrialization and export-led growth are the exception, not the rule, in the region. Repeated attempts by aid donors and local governments to encourage such growth have produced boom-bust cycles of investment, but not sustainable industrial economies. The, the past half-century's economic development in most of the islands has been founded upon the modern infrastructure installed prior to and during decolonization. And the growth and maintenance of living standards have been import-led, funded from a diverse range of resources. It has been the quest to finance, the quest for means to finance rising imports without incurring unsustainable indebtedness that has dictated the various economies' structural evolution, including the establishment of large diasporas of migrant workers. Through migration, remittances, aid, and bureaucracy, acronym MIRAB, along with small island tourism economies, acronym SITES, or SITS, and dimensions of local jurisdictional autonomy, the indigenous population maximizes its material well-being by means of globalization and a willingness to seize opportunities as they arise. Although development challenges largely reflect Western perspectives and agendas, they nonetheless exercise considerable influence on decision-making at the local level through the very nature of globalization with its unequal power relations. Focusing on human health indicators and a selected group of environmental impacts, we will examine how globalization has shaped Pacific Island communities. The World Health Organization, WHO, defines health as, quote, a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of 
of disease or infirmity. In the Pacific, spiritual and cultural dimensions of well-being should also be considered in the context of a healthy community, family, and individual. For Pacific Islanders, a holistic communal view of humanity and links to the environment and their spiritual ancestry have been fundamental considerations in their conceptualization of contemporary and past health model. Polynesians were often described as robust and healthy. However, there is evidence of endemic but not fatal diseases such as yaws, filiaresis, and intestinal parasites. Malaria in inland New Guinea and Solomon Islands was also reported. Analysis of bones suggests that arthritis was present in some communities. High maternal and infant mortality were most likely accepted by ancient Pacific societies. Anthropologists have long discussed the irregularity of the food supply in many islands. The feast and famine theory suggests that times of abundant food supply alternated with times of little food. When international explorations, commerce, and trade occurred through shipping missions, it brought successive waves of epidemics to indigenous populations. Several populations were severely reduced in size as a result of this early contact. A period of high mortality occurred in the late 1880s, uh, sorry, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. But populations later stabilized that survivors became immune and programs of health and sanitation were introduced. A high prevalence of obesity and substantial increases since the 1970s are present in many Pacific Island countries, particularly in Polynesia and Micronesia. Dietary change, notably an increase in energy intakes and energy densities in diets, and the evolution of a more sedentary lifestyle are key factors in this epidemic of obesity. Consumption of imported fatty foods and meats are implicated. The emergence of obesity in many Pacific Island nations has also been attributed to increasing numbers of Pacific Island migrants to the United States, New Zealand, Australia, and France, providing a basis for modernization by way of remittances and economic opportunity. Across the region, a number of observers have noted the role of food as an expression of affection and respect, a focus of social interactions, and physical inactivity is still considered the mark of high-status individuals. Results also show that eating imported foods was not related to food preferences or perceptions of nutritional value, but instead related to cost and availability. Poor diets, high in saturated fats, refined sugars and salt, and with limited amounts of fresh vegetables and fruits, limited physical activity and tobacco use, are considered the major causal factors of non-communicable diseases, including coronary heart disease, cardiovascular strokes, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, some forms of cancer, dental caries, and other conditions. The evolution of non-communicable diseases in the Pacific has been attributed to urbanization and westernization that has resulted in changed diets lack of maintenance of ideal body weights, lack of exercise, and tobacco use. Despite economic progress, malnutrition in children is still reported in some Pacific Island countries. For example, estimates reveal that approximately 60% of Pacific children are anemic. Such high prevalence has been attributed to the prevalence of malaria in Melanesian countries and parasitic infections. Significant decreases in infant and child mortality rates have been observed in the past century. However, in some countries facing economic hardship and declining standards of health service, infant mortality has increased. In countries where a low percentage of the population has access to safe drinking water and sanitation, infant and child mortality rates tend to be higher. In all Pacific Island countries, life expectancy for women exceeds that of men. However, women face unique health situations that are reflected in their morbidity statistics, particularly related 
to maternal health. While significant efforts at strengthening epidemiological surveillance, prevention, and treatment have occurred in the Pacific in recent years, there is still limited data on the prevalence of HIV. To date, more than 90% of the cases in the Pacific have been reported from Papua New Guinea. While knowledge about HIV transmission appears to be increasing in some countries as a result of awareness campaigns, there are relatively high levels of early sexual activity and unprotected sex. Pacific communities view mental health as an intrinsic component of health. Traditional beliefs are that disturbed behavior is a manifestation of external spiritual forces, especially ancestral spirits possessing a person who has broken traditional taboos or offended the spirit. In New Zealand, where a large number of Pacific Islanders now live, statistics indicate that they suffer higher rates of mental disorders compared to the total New Zealand population, as well as low level of access to mental health services. Studies of suicide in Micronesia reveal an alarming number of suicides committed per year between 1960 and the mid-1980s. Common causes include rapid social change, cultural factors, and family conflict. Food production in the western half of the Pacific Island region emerged at the end of the Pleistocene after more than 40,000 years of human settlement. Agricultural expansion and intensification would eventually alter terrestrial environments on nearly every habitable island scattered across the world's biggest ocean. The impacts can sometimes be traced to the early stages of human settlement, leading in some cases to resource depression, extirpation, and extinction. All Pacific Island communities practice and most continue to practice agriculture as the basis of their subsistence economy. In association with natural land features, evidence of farming accounts for much of the patterning evident in the region's organically evolved continuing cultural landscapes. Although the principal cultivars of Pacific agriculture, including edible plants, tubers, nut, and fruit trees, used also in building basketry, clothing, and for their pharmacological psychoactive properties were brought to the islands from elsewhere, once introduced, food production was adapted and developed by communities in response to the unique constraints of the oceanic environment. As people traveled eastward from island Southeast Asia, colonizing first Melanesia, Micronesia, and then Polynesia, they encountered for the first time the oceanic environments of high volcanic islands atolls and uplifted coral islands, each requiring different adaptation of the basic farming components. While the Lapita migrants had a mix of terrestrial foraging, marine subsistence, and agricultural production but without rice or other cereals, and appeared to have introduced the first undomesticated rats and domesticated animals to the region, including pig, chicken, and dog, Several of their cultivars can be traced to New Guinea, where wild or domesticated varieties have been identified from late Pleistocene and early Holocene contexts, centuries prior to the arrival of Lapita. Most of the cultivars grown in the region prior to European contact continue to be managed in many parts of the Pacific today. They also include the South American sweet potato, which was introduced to the Pacific perhaps as early as 1,000 years ago, possibly through direct contact between communities in East Polynesia and South America. At higher latitudes, a number of tropical crops could not thrive. In New Zealand, traditional agriculture was dominated by the sweet potato, supplemented by yam vines, taro roots, and gourd. Because of warmer conditions, food production had achieved greater success on the North Island compared to the South Island. However, the long coastline and vast areas of both islands provided ample opportunities for a hunting, gathering, fishing economy that included the exploitation of fern root, large sea mammals, and giant flightless birds. <laughs> 
Food preservation technology reached its zenith on atolls, as people develop ways to process certain foods that could last through periods of scarcity and for use as sea rations among communities that regularly traveled between the islands. Shifting or Swidden cultivation is the most widespread type of cropping system throughout the Pacific Islands. Although dry Swidden farming and small-scale taro pond constructions continue to be most common traditional agricultural practices in the Pacific today, the continuation of these practices belies changes in agricultural practices in the past, visible in large-scale landscape modifications in the relic cultural landscapes of a number of Pacific Islands. Over time, some agricultural practices became more complex and labor-intensive with the development of water control systems or irrigation and intensive dry field cropping systems, most probably in response to population increase following settlement and associated environmental degradation and declining soil fertility. Archaeological evidence associated with intensification of food production includes terracing, canals, or other forms of water control and ultimately led to more defined territorial divisions and evidence of defensive fortifications among many of the islands. At the other end of the spectrum is a process of agricultural disintensification, which may be defined as the abandonment of intensive agricultural practices and the reduction in the amount of labor devoted to agriculture. In the highlands of Papua New Guinea, cash cropping employment opportunities and store-bought foods, the reduction or abandonment of pig raising, and the greater reliance on cassava and higher yielding varieties of sweet potatoes have resulted in a disintensification or reduction of labor input in agriculture. In many Micronesian atolls, Cirtosperma has replaced taro as the dominant root crop because it is reputedly more tolerant to salt than the latter, produces larger corns, and is longer lived. Abandonment of taro patches has also occurred in response to changes in the socioeconomic conditions of the Pacific Islands. Since the mid-1800s, the development of copra, dried coconut, copra plantations, and a cash economy on many atolls led to the abandonment of many citrospermous pits as people grew coconuts for cash. A process called agro-deforestation is currently diminishing the richness of the humanized forests that make up so much of the Pacific landscapes. Reasons for this include the growing significance of imported foods, but also the ignorance among the younger generation of the ecological, economic, and cultural importance of trees. Akin to agro-deforestation is the process of simplification going on in agriculture generally. Even though many new crops have been introduced in Pacific agricultural systems over the past century, the net effect has been to reduce the diversity of species, cultivars, and methods that characterize traditional agriculture. The history of commercial export agriculture in the tropical Pacific Islands is that of export agriculture everywhere in the tropical world. Success and setback, boom and collapse. A common outcome of government and aid schemes in the Pacific to intensify, improve, and increase smallholder commercial production is that people accept the seed money and the subsidies to plant or experiment with manufacturers, external inputs, but drop the enterprise when these monies stop. A related aspect is that Pacific land tenure system militate against the granting of loans for agriculture because the individual farmers do not hold title to the land. On the other hand, most rural people have access to land and enjoy the security of subsistence production to meet kinship obligations for presentations at weddings or funerals or welcoming celebrations.
As Europeans began to establish their own settlement and trading posts across the region during the 19th century, they discovered some tree species of great economic value that could be shipped overseas. The most notable of these was sandalwood traded out of Fiji and Hawaii. In the early 19th century, the intensive harvesting of sandalwood to feed the Chinese market and firewood to feed American whaling ships has been blamed for the wholesale destruction of the Hawaiian lowland native forest and the decimation of the Hawaiian native population before the middle of the century. For most of the 20th century, the organization of the regional timber trade reflected political relationships between Western metropolitan powers and their colonial dependencies. For example, one British company was responsible for three quarters of the logs exported from state-owned native forests in the Solomon Islands during the 1960s and 1970s. Australia consumed most of Papua New Guinea's timber exports during the final period of colonial administration. The initial round of Japanese investment in logging in the native forests of Southeast Asia and the New Guinea region began in the 1970s. More recently, timber barons from Malaysia and Indonesia have been growing influence in controlling the expansion of logging operations to meet the growth in demand for tropical forest timbers, first from Japan and later from mainland China. Given the current rate of harvest, it is reasonable to predict that the native forests of the Solomon Islands will have been logged out within a few years. As in other parts of the world, Pacific Island countries have been found rich mineral endowments, a mixed blessing. Papua New Guinea has been disrupted by a separatist uprising and civil war associated with the Panguna copper mine on Bougainville. In New Caledonia, nickel mines have been the target of local Kanak separatist resistance and concerns over their environmental and social impact. Equally important is mining by indigenous communities. For example, beach mining by householders in Kiribati, Micronesia, see above to the left. To meet the demands for sand and building aggregate is exerting pressure on the atoll's fragile beaches in the face of climate change and sea level rise. Mining clearly brings changes to traditional economies, demographic structures, politics and social organizations that have far-reaching implications for the integrity and identity of local groups in the locality of a mine. Where mining has come to remote rural areas, the focus of social activity becomes the mining town. Over time, these settlements attract a migrant population of hopeful people. The growth of such settlement settlements is hard to avoid piecemeal dwellings spring up around the core, often poorly serviced. They become centers for prostitution, alcoholism, petty crime, and violence. Health problems, including malnutrition among children, may surface. Cross-cultural tension is often high, particularly in the context of labor relations. Arguably, the greatest social and economic impact falls on women. Absentee partners working at the mine may mean increased workloads for women who may be denied access to salaried work at the project. Large-scale open mines bring a range of environmental effects. Land is permanently disturbed and lost. Other impacts include the disposal of waste rock and tailings, as well as chemicals such as mercury and cyanide in the case of gold extraction. On Nauru and Banaba, Ocean Island, a century of phosphate mining consumed most of these raised coral islands, with few prospects for rehabilitation. The dependence of Pacific Island countries upon ocean resources has been a vital part of their cultural, social, and economic development. The coastal and marine ecosystems of the region are extremely important habitats for sustaining the livelihoods by providing food and nutritional security. With limited arable land and poor soils in the low-lying islands, the reliance on marine resources is extremely important. Economic activities such as fisheries, tourism and trade are highly dependent on the marine environment. 
On the other hand, the economies and environments of many of the island countries are extremely fragile, not only in relation to the global economy, but also because of their vulnerability to a wide range of environmental factors. Natural disasters such as cyclones, floods, drought, increasing amounts of waste and pollution and overexploitation of resources pose major threats to realizing the ocean's potential. In most Pacific islands, coastal fisheries are characterized as artisanal and subsistence fishing carried out in the lagoons, on the mudflat, reefs and outer shells, and in offshore areas extending to a distance where small vessels can operate. Subsistence fishing, commonly regulated by local customs, contributes to preservation of cultural traditions and helps maintain social cohesion of coastal communities. Pacific Island countries do not export many varieties of coastal fisheries products. The principal exports include dried sea cucumber, trochus shells, pearls and aquarium fish, coral and seaweed, most of which are targeted at specific niche markets. Tuna fishing ranges from small-scale artisanal operations in the coastal areas to large-scale industrial per seine, long line, and pole and line operations in the exclusive economic zones, known as EEZs or EEZs, of Pacific Island countries and on the high seas. With limited sources of revenues, many governments in the region have given priority to their short-term economic needs by issuing more licenses than recommended by scientific advisors. This has led to the overexploitation of important tuna resources such as Big Eye and Yellowfin tuna. The vast distances between the islands also makes monitoring and surveillance work both logically, logistically pardon, difficult and expensive. Many countries in the region are fragmented, with numerous populated islands and distinct language and cultural groups. Prospects for economic growth are limited. Constraints include remoteness and isolation, resulting in high transport costs to market and costly tourism, diseconomies of scale with small domestic markets, limited natural resources and a narrow production base, substantial trade deficits, few local skills, vulnerability to external shocks and natural disasters, mainly cyclones and floods, and a disproportionately high expenditure on administration. Political systems have sometimes been fragile, ecological structures vulnerable, and economies lacking diversity. Development problems have intensified with the shift from older reliance on commodities towards a more diversified but less protected economy involving the liberalization of trade, the globalization of production, and intensified pressure on resources on both land and sea. Smaller and more vulnerable islands have become a more evidently peripheral and dependent part of a wider world. Pacific Islanders, however, have never been passive in the face of change. Indeed, adaptation, resilience, and making the most out of livelihood opportunities is evident throughout the region in the form of vibrant informal sectors, subsistence farming, continuity of intergenerational migration, and remittance flows, and the politics of aid. As is the case with other contemporary states and societies, globalization limits the opportunities for development, but also opens up new windows. Increasing numbers of people are becoming reliant on having cash to meet their basic needs. Though prevalent at independence, a traditional subsistence, non-cash lifestyle is now almost impossible for most Pacific Islanders. The trend towards cash societies has hastened a greater individualism, leading in turn to a broadening of horizons and a narrowing and weakening of ties among family members. Government policies are often double-edged. In a number of countries, economic reforms have contributed directly to the hardship and poverty that are reportedly being experienced by many households. Yet, they are essential in keeping economies afloat and are an important factor in maintaining aid flows from regional donors and in international development banks. 
Globalization is not the only underlying cause of growing poverty and hardship. Increasing flows of people, trade, and services have also presented opportunities and challenges. The creation of new employment opportunities in the global security industry, in sports, in caregiving, and in other temporary labor schemes are all challenges of global labor flows. It may be argued as well that Pacific Islanders, through migration and the creation of transnational corporation of kin, have successfully adapted to global flows and opportunities, and that globalization is an important part of modern islander identity. The changes brought about by access to and dependence on cash incomes are manifest in outer islands and rural areas. Dependency ratios are ra rising as elderly family members are being left to care for grandchildren and when the younger generation moves to the urban centers or overseas. Thus, the elderly less commonly being cared for in the traditional ways are becoming increasingly burdened with additional responsibilities. It is also seen in the attitude of youth who are no longer generally satisfied with the prospect of a traditional Pacific subsistence lifestyle. As we have seen, Pacific Islanders have increasingly migrated to metropolitan centers, whether at home or abroad. De this deteriorized development strategy has become an unusual, often state-sanctioned alternative development model. Limited modern development opportunities of island states have ensured that subsistence-based economies have survived longer than in most parts of the world, though the diversity of production has declined as even more remote people have oriented towards a cash economy. Ubiquitous frustration with at least some aspects of development, modernity, and progress brought recognition that, quote, progress has been problematic, uneven, disruptive of the social order, environmentally damaging, and required rethinking in a more local context. Conservation has sometimes led to the revitalization of an older, older. In many parts of Melanesia, a more traditional political order has meant the establishment of chiefs and chiefly councils, even where chiefs were absent in the past, while efforts have been made to secure the integrity of languages, ignore mission religion, and revive exchange goods and mechanisms. In conclusion, Local communities have embraced new forms of hybridity and syncretism, where variants of the new were grafted onto the old. Simultaneous emphasis on both the locality and globalization did not bind together antithetical phenomena, but simply made them more comprehensible and appropriate. In some respects, this could be seen as resistance reflecting subtle, culturally specific, but hybrid value systems that fuse culture, politics, economics, religion, and social structure, partly in opposition to imposed systems and partly in the co-option of these systems in order to stimulate a culturally appropriate and sustainable social and economic development. Additional resources have been included in this presentation, including 10 YouTube videos. Thank you.